Hello everyone and welcome to AIDS Map Live. I'm thrilled to be joined by an absolutely amazing panel in beautiful colours today, guys, <laughs> thank you. We're going to be discussing things that people can do to maximise their health while living with HIV. If you have any questions, do please get them over on, on Twitter and Facebook and hopefully if technology works, they will be sent over to me. So, first of all, let's meet our panel. First of all, we have Jack Summerside, oh my goodness, who is the Head of Health and Wellbeing at Positive East, leading the charity's peer support, counselling and clinical psychology work promoting better futures for positive people who live or get their HIV treatment in East London. Jack's been living with HIV since 95 and has had a very long <laughs> <laughs> career in HIV. In fact, we worked together 20 years ago at the UK Coalition of People Living with HIV. And, and Jack, I think we look exactly the same. We haven't changed a bit. If anything, we've got younger. Yeah, absolutely. And Jack, what is that T-shirt well, you are wearing? Very subtly. <laughs> I'm wearing a red T-shirt to match my eyes. And this is to promote uh, the Red Run, which a whole bunch of HIV charities across London are coming together on the last weekend of November. And for a 5K or a 10K run, you can run if you want, or you can walk, or you can sashay, or you can come and see me in the tent where the coffee is and where I'll be, um, <laughs> we'll be having a little mini um, exhibition of the UK AIDS quilts. Fantastic. We'll be looking forward to that. I think maybe sashaying. Oh along. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not I'll, running. <laughs> I'll see what I'll see what I can summon up. Yeah. Next, I'm thrilled to have Michelle Bocker, one of the youth project coordinators at Positively UK and provides peer support to young adults aged 18 to 30. Hi Michelle. Michelle has also you were featured in one of the positive champion videos about why people with HIV, um, people, sh why people from black communities should test for HIV? Yes, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm glad that so many people have seen it and hopefully have taken away something from it. So. Fantastic, and you also had the pleasure of coming to Croydon. Yeah, oh yeah, Croydon, it was my first time going to Croydon and, and I saw tramps and I was like, where am I? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's actually pretty nice. Yeah. yeah, great place, Croydon. So, yes, <laughs> don't diss it. Next, we have Laswana Griffith living fabulously with HIV for over 20 years, married to a negative partner. You have three negative children, is that right? The last being a surprise <laughs> and only 18 months old. My boss. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> Currently training to be a nurse, midwife in her spare time and sits on advisory boards, is a trustee of two positive organisations and has been an HIV activist for over 18 years. Is that right? So how is coping with an 18-month old baby? I have a boss at work and I have a boss at home. <laughs> <laughs> and because she can say sentences now, it's hilarious. No, I'll do it. Quite a lot like her mum, <laughs> really. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. Next, Dr. Tristan Barber. Hello, Tristan. Hello. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Tristan is a consultant physician in HIV medicine at the Ian Charleston Day Centre Royal Free Hospital and an honorary associate professor at the Institute for Global Health, University College. London. Ooh. Ooh, thank <laughs> so, you. He's currently Honorary Secretary for the British HIV Association and Chair of the Board of Trustees for the peer support charity Positively UK. Thank you so much for coming. It's Tristan. a great delight to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so you've been on before, haven't you? I have. It's studio. been a little while, but it's nice to be back. It's brilliant to have you back. And finally, last but very much not least, we have Angelina Namiba. 
Angelina has been living with HIV since the early 90s and has over 26 years experience in the sector with a special interest in the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV, particularly through pregnancy. She's founding a member of the 4M Network of Mental Mothers, a trustee of NAT, Save Kenya, and sits on about a million advisory boards. <laughs> is, is that right? That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> And Angelina, you've had a long time to prepare for today, was it? What time was it that you agreed? I think you contacted me about midday today. <laughs> so, fantastic for joining us. And I hear you have a book that's out. <laughs> As Jack has had a chance to promote Red Run. Yes, absolutely. So actually, I'm actually beginning to start feeling like a serial guest attender, you know. But yeah, no, we do have a book out. It's called Our Stories Told by Us, and it is a book celebrating the African contribution to the UK HIV response. You can find more information about it on OurStoriesToldByUs.com. Fantastic. Thank you. So people have already sent questions over, so let, let's you. kick off. So I'll start with you, Tristan. When we talk about good health, with HIV, what do people normally mean by that? Wow, that's such a big question. I guess um, for me, I think about it in terms of really biomedical health, but also our social uh, and psychological health and well-being, and of course, really important thinking about quality of life. And some of these things will differ for different people. What gives you good quality of life might be the same as me, Susan, or it might be um, something different. And I think it's very important that we do think about ways to maximise quality of life. And that all ties in, I think, with healthy living. For some people, going to the gym every day will be something they enjoy and keeps them healthy. For other people, it sounds like a prison sentence <laughs> and would make them miserable. And I think it's finding the balance between all of these things that really keeps us well. Unfortunately, what some of the advice then ends up sounding like is, is boring moderation. So drink sensibly, don't take recreational drugs or moderate your recreational drug intake, don't smoke or reduce the amount you're smoking, exercise as much as you're able. But I think really it's about finding the sweet spot in all of these things for you, maximising your quality of life whilst also keeping yourself healthy and well. Fantastic. And, and Angelina, do you think that there's enough of a focus on quality of life? Because often people talk about our CD4 counts and our, our viral loads and don't actually consider some of the other th aspects in terms of our health. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know, to add on to what Tristan said, it really is important to look at good quality of life beyond viral suppression. Of course, taking treatments and achieving and maintaining, a, you know, undetectable value is very important. However, we are other things in our lives and we can do, you know, the traditional stuff like keeping active, for instance, but not just active. I know you take your dogs for a walk once in a while, <laughs> um, but, you know, people walk. I know my friend memory walks and Julie, our friend, also swims, you know, every day in you know, in the cold water pools, of course, I only swim once a week um, in indoor. But I think being active, but also we being active against self-stigma. So it's not just the, you know, the traditional active stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also really important, I feel, in a way, can I just summarize what I think might be a good way of doing it is just following the five steps to well-being. You know, so being active, giving back. A lot of us volunteer in all sorts of different ways taking notice of what is around us in nature, but also what's happening with our bodies. So for instance, you and I <clears throat> are approaching the menopause and you know, it's good to be able to join programs like Bearded and Flushed where you look at the menopause in a irreverent and fun way, you know, and also just nurturing and maintaining good relationships is really important. And then connecting as well, you know, connecting with each other and mentoring each other, I think is really important in addition to taking treatment. Absolutely, very good point. And we, we touched on the menopause, I think. <laughs> I mean, what's your experience like? How have you been? Um, I know that you're very young, but just in terms of like recently having a baby, but then potentially coming close to entering the menopause. I am perimenopausal. Um, I had the baby, and I thought I was going through the menopause, um, but now <coughs> constantly have to have a fan. I sweat buckets. I actually forgot about today. It's only because I saw a tweet <laughs> that I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> Brain fog. Yeah. It, all the top tier stuff I'm yeah. being blessed with right now. It can, it can be really challenging. And, and I think that peer support around 
the, the menopause journey and other aspects of our, our health is, is really important. I mean, how, obviously, you're, you're quite a long way off in, in relation to the menopause, but how important is peer support for young people living with HIV? I think peer support is incredibly important for young people. I think it's nice to just have someone there who's experiencing the same thing as you. And obviously, like, as people living with HIV, not everything about us is going to be the same but we can find some sim similarities that way. And it's like, you're talking to someone who understands you and won't judge you. Um, so it's really nice having a safe space that people can come to and feel like they can tell us about um, things that they won't be able to speak to their family or their friends or like their doctors about. Like we're just there to like create like a space for conversation, so. Mm -hmm. Great, and, uh, and Jack, obviously you've been involved in HIV like for, forever in terms of working in, the <laughs> <laughs> working in the sector. Mm. Has peer support been important to you, both in terms of working in the sector and, and potentially receiving it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would say getting involved in things, finding a passion, finding something that gives you joy, can give you a strong sense of your own identity. It can help you deal with um, self-stigma and the stigma around. and. I think I hadn't noticed, I hadn't quite appreciated how much, how important having a network of peers immediately around you mm. was until I moved away from London and um, moved up to Newcastle in 2014 for family reasons. And I found myself in a situation where there was an absence of that. that uh, um, mm. I mean, I, I, I yeah. reached out and it, it, that wasn't always the case, but to suddenly find yourself in that position, I realised that I'd, I'd had been in quite a luxurious position of having that all around me throughout my journey from diagnosis from 1995 right up to 2014. And working in the HIV sector in charities, both in a voluntary position and a paid position, is how I got to know all of you guys. And it's like, I've known you 20 years, I've known you since... When? God knows when. <laughs> and, yeah, and Trist, years. But then there's always new people that you get mm. to meet, like these guys as well, and it's always a joy, and it brings such richness and breadth to your life. Um, I, I would say to anybody, find out where your local peer support group is. If there isn't one, perhaps talk to your clinic about ways of establishing that. Talk to your local CVS-type organisation, how to set up a constitution as an organisation. Mm. Just do it and create it and sustain it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about burnout later on, yes. but yeah, but grasp that opportunity, make it. And anyone going along to a peer support group, go with the mindset that you're offering support to someone else there, not just that you're there to be peer supported. Think of it as a mutual kind of arrangement. Mm, you know, absolutely. I mean, we talked a, you know, a little bit about mental health being important in, in relation to good health. But, Tristan, it seems that people with HIV are more likely to experience mental health problems. Why do you think that is? Well, again, I think there's a huge um, intersection of issues that can impact on, on mental well-being in people living with HIV. Um, I think, of course, uh, mental health issues can impact on your risk of acquiring HIV in the first place, perhaps, as well. Lots of us sometimes find for instance, talking about peer support, but when you first move, for instance, to a big city and you find lots of people who are like you, you might find a lot of validation, for instance, in mm. sexual activity if you felt very excluded. I mean, everyone enjoys sex anyway, but particularly perhaps if you felt very excluded and uh, not included in the past, you might, uh, you know, you, you might use sex in a way to meet people uh, when you are first in an environment where you feel very comfortable to do so. Um, so that could perhaps put you at more risk of HIV in the first place, perhaps, if you're not well supported at that stage. So I think we have to support, think about supporting particularly young people in terms of their development to be empowered to negotiate the kind of sex that they want to have, to use prevention methods uh, and so on. And then I think when you're looking at people who are already living with HIV, I think you have to think about people in, in very different ways. I won't kind of split people up at the moment, but of course we've got people who've been living with HIV for a, for a very long time who were given a much shorter life expectancy, who may have been told to stop work, may have lost loved ones and friends in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, and whose life course has been really affected by HIV in a very dramatic way. And then we have other people for whom perhaps a more recent HIV acquisition might have a different impact. I'm not going to say easier or harder, but it may impact them very differently. 
Um, and then, of course, we have intersecting stigmas around HIV and who HIV affects, people who inject drugs, sex workers, uh, historically, of course, black Africans and gay men, but an increasing diverse number of people, uh, trans people disproportionately, and uh, we know already that these people may be suffering from different aspects of stigma, uh, and HIV itself can remain very stigmatizing. Certainly when I see new diagnoses now in many people, the language uh, some people are using to talk about HIV is 20 or 30 years old because we're testing people in emergency departments who may never have thought HIV was going to, to enter their world. And you hear these very old fashioned stigmatizing views around HIV that we have to support them around with, with more information. So, and I think also if you think about poverty, education, all these things that can impact on someone's risk of acquiring HIV in the first place. And finally, perhaps, although I'm sure it's not the final point, others may add more, but thinking about how people cope with an HIV diagnosis, you can cope in some of the positive ways that Angelina's referred to, but for some other people, it may be a time where their alcohol or their drug usage oh. increases, and this can again impact adversely on their mental health. So a huge number of reasons uh, that can mean that people need extra support when they're living with HIV. Absolutely. And, and you touched on intersecting issues that affect people. And, and very often it's the <coughs> other things that are going on in our lives that's uh, affecting us in terms of our health, not necessarily HIV ourselves. Is that something that, that you hear from the young people that you're, you work with, Michelle? Yeah, I was thinking about this today and about why a lot of young people may not feel able to get access to care um, because like you said, like there's so many other factors mm. that go into our lives separate from HIV. Like if you're a young person trying to navigate like who you are and who you want to be, that can be very like overwhelming. And also if you're like a carer of a family member, if you're going to university, if you're starting a job, um, all of these factors can like make it seem really hard to cope with. Mm. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes health isn't at the forefront, even though it could be very helpful. Um, and because like I do clinical work in like different clinics around London and I'm in North Middlesex alongside my colleague Eli. So we go in there each Monday, first Monday of the month, and, you know, we meet up with the doctors and stuff, the MDT meetings, and um, we are able to, like, provide snacks, provide, like, re travel reimbursement. Um, we work alongside the psychologist and um, a UK cab member who talks about, like, um, benefits and stuff. Um, and we also have, like, are able to, like, give young people access to, like, life coaching and stuff, even mm -hmm. though it's very limited. So I think it's also about, like if you are working in a clinic, making sure that your patients know like exactly what services you provide. Um, and we're also like doing a survey there as, there as well to see like what the, how they experience the clinic as well. And like just getting feedback from them. But I guess if you are like struggling with accessing your young people, then it's maybe good to like see what funding's available and see like what other services you can provide. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and funding is so often a problem, particularly when people uh, are experiencing psychological distress. I remember like back in the day, you know, all clinics seemed had like psychologists in the clinic. So wait, what, what advice do you give to people, Jack, who come to you and, and they're having psychological problems? Well, we're fortunate at uh, Positive East in that we do have a clinical psychologist who heads up our Reassure program. Mm. And that's specifically um, uh, for women living with HIV who've had some experience of trauma. You could argue that most, <laughs> most women living with HIV will have experienced trauma in some degree or other, but we're, we, we're often talking about women who've had um, quite significant trauma. They're often they've often had very difficult journeys to get here to the UK or offer an asylum seekers. So yeah. they've been witness to genocide and murder and sexual assault and rape and trafficking, lots of really, really complex issues. We've all, we're also really fortunate in that we have a team of volunteer counsellors headed up by Andre who uh, coordinates our counselling. And we're able to then offer counselling to, to people in East London 
with a much shorter sort of waiting period than they would if they were going to their GP mm. or if they were relying on the psychological services available in the hospital. Now, what we can't do is if somebody's got very complex, very complex mental health needs, we can't replace clinical services. We're not that kind of thing. What we're finding increasingly as pressure increases on the NHS, there are fewer psychologists there, there isn't necessarily the budget for it, but even if there is the budget, there's lots of unfilled posts. Mm. So we really have to watch the balance of that because it's, it's, it's hard for charities, HIV charities, to raise the funds to deliver those kinds of services and we can't be just picking up the slack of gaps in the NHS. That isn't a viable long-term solution. Of course, yeah, yeah no, abs absolutely. And I know that, that women with HIV face intersecting forms of stigma, discrimination and, and disadvantage. I mean, what sort of things do you say to the women that you work with who may be experiencing these issues? We're lucky enough to have groups where we come together, we do things like date night, I think they're coming up soon, and women get to express what they're going through and discuss different situations from sex to bills to housing, and it's a free space, safe space, where there's no judgment. And if one of us don't know, someone else does. Yeah. And it's a community that I will say always come together when needed. Mm. I've been blessed by ha being able to have all these lovely people help me when I was low. So yeah, it's having the experts work with us as well as having peer support someone who's living the well could be living the same as yourself mm, absolutely um, and angelina i know lots of people come to you for <laughs> a lot <laughs> all the, we all go to you for, for advice so i mean what advice would you give to someone living with hiv who may be experiencing emotional distress I think there's so many things you could say, but the first thing is um, you're not alone because there's so many of us who've gone through that and so many people experiencing it, even just within the general population. Um, first thing is, second thing is that it's really, really important to seek help, whether it's, and I know it's maybe hard to get to a psychologist, but get support mm -hmm. from a peer, a peer mentor, somebody like you who then will be able to signpost you to where you can get support. Because sometimes just being able to talk about it in itself is enough and then it can help you to recognize what is actually going on and that person may have gone through all those issues and can give you a bit of a point about well, how you can deal with them but definitely don't don't keep quiet about it there are many of us going through it speak to somebody else get the support that you need and if you don't get the support that you if the support that you're given isn't what you want mm. then ask for more support mm. or change whoever you're working with there's mm. always somewhere that you can get support that would be right for you, and it has to be right for you. Mm. I was just going to add a small comment, if I, if I may, just also thinking about uh, your comment as well, which is that I think we would love every clinic to be perfect and every clinic to offer every service. Um, I'm not going to name specific services, including my own, but I think what we do see, if you look around London or around the UK, is some places have been able to keep their psychologists, some people haven't. Some clinics have, for instance, a full-time dietitian. Other clinics have no access to a dietitian. Uh, some clinics may have a joint integrated women's service where you can have contraception, your HIV care and your smear test done, and another clinic may not offer that. Um, it can be uh, difficult if you've built up a long relationship with a clinic to move. But again, I think through peer networks and through other um, uh, charities and voluntary sector organisations, you can ask people who are attending other services and you may find that by dipping your toe in another service, you don't have to necessarily transfer your care immediately, but you may find there's a service there that does suit your needs. Particularly, I was thinking about your comment, Jack, about psychology, um, acknowledging that not all clinics and services have been able to preserve psychological services in the same way but if someone does need a lot of psychological support they they will be able to find a clinic that still has dedicated HIV psychology where they can access that so don't feel nervous about finding out what's happening at other other centers mm -hmm. yeah, uh, just can I just add as well to that you've just reminded me of something because 
Also, it's as we've also we can allude to the fact that it may be difficult to get access to a psychologist for a one-to-one, -one, but actually there are other ways to do that. So for instance, uh, at the Forum Network, we're going to start a project which is going to be called Pouring from a Full Cup, whereby we support uh, mentors to support others. But within that project, we will have sessions at, during date nights, whereby we've actually been able to, uh, to approach and a couple of psychologists who've agreed to provide their support pro bono. So when we have the date night, the first part of the date night will be, we will have a psychologist present to, to do support for all the women together in a group setting. So even if you can't get a one-on-one, -on -one, there are also other ways that you can get it together with other women. And this, if it's facilitated by psychologists, then it means 10, 20, 30 of us are getting that support. It may not be in-depth, but at least they have access to that. So there's other ways oh. to do it as well. Can I do a plug? Just on that very point that Angelina makes, as well as our one-to-one -one counselling and psychology, we have a number of different groups. I mean, um, next week we've got the rather fantastic Michelle Croston coming to do um, another uh, Compassionate Minds workshop around mm -hmm. self-compassion. And then there's an app that you can use afterwards. But we also have, uh, within our Reassure program, we have our fabulous Stitch Sisters, which is what it says. It's like we hire in a bunch of sewing machines Whoa. and we make some garments. And then at the end of the, the series, Last year, we, d we transformed our cafe area into a, a, into a catwalk and did the whole kind of runway thing. And it was, that was so empowering for the women taking part, you know, to actually make things. But then it was all led by a clinical psychologist. So people reveal things and share things that they wouldn't necessarily in a one-to-one -one conversation. Mm. So other things, we, we're, we're also going to be running our sex and relationships course for women Ooh. coming up uh, later in the year. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and that, that's going to explore things about your relationship with your body, understanding your anatomy and pleasure. I mean, do you, do you remember pleasure? I can't, yeah, I, can't, I mean, it's been a while, but you know, <laughs> all of that kind of thing in a four session, of course. And, and, and that, all, all those uh, sort of things, bringing people together, um, enhanced by the role of the, of the, of, of the skilled uh, mental health professional and people engaging together with one another. There's a huge amount that comes from that and it becomes more than the sum of its parts. Sure. So look out for those opportunities that are available. Mm. And if those opportunities aren't available where you are, have a word with us and let's see how we can um, help you and, and kind of share some tips about how to make that available in, in Carlisle or wherever Absolutely. people are watching from, yeah? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned sex because we've had a question <laughs> from the audience. Could you ask the panel if they have any thoughts on how important a good sex life is when it comes to having good health? Who, the swana, would you like? <laughs> I'd like to take this yes. one. Yes, it's vital. Um, I say all the time, one of the questions that clinicians should ask their patients is, are you having a good sex life? Because the amount of information you can get from just that question is mind-blowing. If they, of which most people do, they're comfortable with their consultant, they're happy to say, look, I'm only living where I'm living because it, I have to have sex with this person to keep a roof over my head mm. for me and my kids. And from there, they're asking for help. And that's what I wanted to add when we were saying about if you are going through something, First step is just saying, I need help. Mm. It may be embarrassing, but the minute you put it out there, so many suggestions will come back to you and so much help as well. It doesn't have to be someone professional. Most of the peer, well, all the peers are fully trained. There's a program where we're all trained up mm. with different parts and, and knowledgeable about this and that. And if we don't know, we'll know where to refer you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. And I, I'm glad that you, you talked about sexual pleasure mm. because that's something that often, you know, p people don't really talk about it, particularly in terms of older women with, with HIV. And I know for women going through the menopause, it's not just about hot flushes. It's also <laughs> about things like, like dry vaginas <laughs> and, and painful sex. And it can be quite embarrassing sometimes to actually go to the doctor and, and, and seek help. So, Tristan, dry vaginas, <laughs> what, would you, what would you recommend? Please, please, please talk to us about dry vaginas. Yes. Please, no, but I, we should be asking. Well, often yeah. it's, it's actually not just lube. Sometimes, of course, it's estrogen. It's yes. hormone replacement. 
uh, that can be very useful. I love the idea that we should be asking that question to everyone. I think many people, um, older women you're exactly correct to point out, but I think older men as well, older certainly older uh, LGBT QI plus populations as well. You know, there's not a lot of research on older uh, sexual pleasure for trans populations in particular, perhaps, but thinking about, um, you know, we've had some things that have, are fantastic, of course, you know, legalization of gay marriage, but I think some people still hold in their heads a kind of Victorian idea of how their parents aged, and we shouldn't talk about that kind of thing as we get older, and we're not supposed to enjoy it anyway, which is really terrible. Of course, we should be having fantastic fantastic and functional sex lives um, throughout our lives, adding to the quality of life that we've talked about already. It's very interesting when we did ask, I was thinking about your point, and we had a, a questionnaire once in our clinic. At the time, it was really dedicated at people who are getting older with HIV. Now it's more a complex clinic for people who have got a lot of comorbidities. But we had a questionnaire, and on it, one of the quality of life questions was around sex. And a lot of people would cross through it and just put not relevant. And I was thinking, actually, this is interesting because at the time we thought, well, they're not sexually active. But now listening to your point, of course, it's like an aha moment I should have thought of earlier. Really what they're saying is maybe or could have been saying is it's not that it's irrelevant. It's that this is an issue for me that's not being addressed or I don't know how to ask for help with. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's very important that we do ask the question and that physical issues, including things like dry vaginas, <laughs> um, but also questions about lubrication, erectile dysfunction, uh, and for people who don't have binary anatomy, you know, that we ask questions where we can actually help uh, and support people. A little bit like Jack's mentioned about the loss of psychology services, we as clinicians sometimes feel frightened to ask because we haven't got the right services to refer on to. But if not, we need to find those pathways. We need to advocate for having access to those services again. It shouldn't stop us from asking the questions in the first place. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and Michelle, is it something in terms of young people that you work with like navigating relationships, is that a challenge that comes up? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, especially if they haven't shared their status with someone that they're seeing, it can be like like a lot of shame. I know I speak about shame a lot. I feel like I watched Brene Brown. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, just feeling like a lot of fear if I share my status with this person, like... How are they going to feel about me? What if things change? What if this is the only person that will um, actually love me, which is very heartbreaking, um, and not really want to lose that connection with someone? Um, I feel like it's one of the top questions I get asked, like, how do I share my status with this person? Like, how do I go about it? And my colleague Eli, <laughs> he created, like, this worksheet, um, and it explores, like, the best ways to tell people, and you need to think about, like, where you're going to tell them, um, when, what's the right environment, like what you're going to say. So sometimes in like the peer support sessions, like we go through that worksheet and actually remind them that it's more about how you're going to be okay, regardless of what the response is going to be. Um, but I think hate, having HIV can be very much, um, it can impacts your sex life a lot and especially because you know like the whole like oh I don't feel clean like clean and dirty thing mm, as well yeah. not feeling attractive especially if you're a woman like not feeling attractive because of HIV feeling like no one will find sexually appealing and stuff so it can be a lot yeah it can be difficult and Jack I know that you were one of the first people to start talking about you equals you when it was like just around the Swiss statement yeah I mean, how important do you think the you equals you message is in, in terms of combating self-stigma and, and stigma around sex and HIV? I think it's incredibly important in, in, in that it it can change the way you feel about yourself. An example, uh, back f for me, um, I've been undetectable since 2003. About 18 months ago, I had a blip in my viral load. It was just about a thousand. And I felt very different about myself. I felt, really, felt very different about the prospect uh, of having sex. And I'm just jumping back a little bit as well, I do want to slightly be devil's advocate and hold a torch for those who can't be bothered to have sex and really don't want to do it. So we, we, need to be, we need to be really careful that we're not saying to people, but you must, yeah. you no, must I'm have sorry. an orgasm. It's all about, it's all about uh, choice, yeah. personal choice. Yeah. So I think that whole you equals you, um, 
it's not reaching a lot of the people living with HIV in a meaningful way and in a way that people can actually own and get that psychological benefit from and the practical benefit and that freedom of what it means for their lives. And I think there's lots of deep-seated reasons why lots of communities aren't as trusting of what mainstream medical information comes out. And that's mirrored in things like suspicion around the COVID vaccination in, in a lot of minoritized communities. So that U equals U, I'm very often having conversations with people where they say, is this true? And then be having conversations one to one and in groups. And we know that those conversations have been had with their doctors. However, there's an awful lot of people out there who probably have still not heard U equals U. Mm. Both HIV positive and HIV negative. And I think there's a lot we could do to get that, that message embedded and talked about in the kind of peer groups that we have, for people living with HIV. But I think what all of us can do individually, so I very nearly wore my Polari Press U equals U t-shirt yeah. as, as an alternative <laughs> to this. There's a lot we can do as people living with HIV to stand up and get that message across. Um, um, absolutely, and I, I think it's also important that we don't stigmatise people who have a detectable viral load mm. for whatever reason mm. um, as well. And it was interesting that you raised about uh, people from minoritised communities. I know coming from a Caribbean community myself, people from our communities have experienced for generations mm. health inequalities and it's understandable why many people may be untrusting of, of healthcare professionals. I know for me uh, many years ago when my, uh, my grandmother was in the hospital um, I remember someone wrote why bother on her notes but before she died. And so it's understandable that my, my mum and my aunt and people in my family are just really scared and, and concerned about you know, going into hospital. And you know, we see health inequalities in HIV, but we see it across disease areas. Mm. So I, mean, I think action really needs to be taken in, in terms of that. And also, I think it's really important that it's people from our communities who are going out and speaking to people um, about their concerns. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I actually work on a ward and I only informed my manager when I started working there that I was positive. And so I could see how my colleagues interacted mm. with other people. And we do have people who come on the ward and are positive and I have to say that they are 1010. They use universal precautions, which is the same for everybody. Yeah. And they're not discriminative. They're, it, it's like any other patient. If that person's rude, then yeah, <laughs> they'll have a, a, a knockback. But coming to their status, be it hepatitis or TB, HIV, perfect. So, but when I was pregnant, I went for my first appointment and the midwife who was meant to see me was sick, so another midwife took over. We got, them appointments are like an hour and a half long. We got to the last part and she's like, oh, would you like to be tested for Down syndrome, HIV and all these things? I go, well, I'm fine for the HIV, I already know that I'm positive. Mm. She stopped the whole thing, went out of the room, spoke to three different midwives, I could hear her outside the room. And I was like, do I say to her, do you know who I am and what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Or watch what happens. So I left her to it. I let her do it. And I, when I walked out of there, I was like, if I was a first time mum, I found out in pregnancy that I am positive and she did that to me, I would not come back to this hospital. I, I probably wouldn't have, I'd be lost to care. Yeah. Anything could happen to me and this baby. But I... I went all the way <laughs> good, good. to the point where I've asked, can I come back and train your midwives? And I'm very disappointed in the trust that that happened. But yeah, it will be resolved. Um, absolutely. And I think people often experience stigma in healthcare settings than anywhere else. But um, Angelina, in relation to women who are pregnant, what, what advice would you give to someone going through pregnancy? <laughs> 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 I 
I think Lesan has articulated really well. But I think, again, important not to be quiet about it. You may not be able to raise it with the person who's actually providing care for you, but there will be a peer, there will be another consultant, there will be somebody within the healthcare team that you can actually speak to, but raise the issue uh, in a non-confrontational way. Um, because if you don't raise it, it's not going to get resolved. And I know mm. it's, sometimes it's hard. I mean, I've, on a practical level myself, uh, old as I am and outspoken as I am, when I was really, really ill in hospital, I did have just one. The whole six months I was in fantastic care, but there was mm. one point when I experienced a bit of discrimination from a nurse, and I didn't say anything because I didn't feel able to because I thought, well, she's looking after me. You know, it was something to do with a, something about, can I just give a quick example? Mm. Um, I'd gone in, and as I always advise people, if you're going in, to always have a spare stash of medication with you in case you go into hospital yeah. or anything. And so I was admitted at very short notice. I went in for a one-day open. I stayed for six months. Anyway, when I went in, I had a whole, you know, a few months um, medication with me. And then when I was, and the nurses obviously would be the ones giving it to me. And at one point at one hospital, then has dispensed one of the medications mm. for me. It was a generic medication. There's nothing wrong with generics, but it's just, just to give you, to put it into yeah. context. And I said, well, don't worry, I still have my medication. When this runs out, then I'll start taking that. And she said, well, now I'm going to have to throw this tablet away. Do, do you know how much medication costs? And so I didn't say anything, mm -hmm. despite the fact that I could have there and then given her a 15-minute lecture about generic medication, who produces them, how much yeah. they cost, etc. Yeah. But I couldn't say anything. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't about the general, it's just about I had medication already, so I didn't need any more until I was, mm -hmm. I'd run out. But I didn't say anything. I later on spoke to the pharmacist, the ward manager, then because I was friendly with, her, with him, so I was mm -hmm. able to talk to her. Yeah. So it's really important to speak out when you're able to, but just don't keep quiet about it because somebody else will experience that. And it's you speaking out that is going to actually change practice for many other people coming behind you. Uh, absolutely. And, and Tristan, what advice would you give to someone who feels that they're not getting the care they deserve? I agree. Speak out. It's very important. Yeah. I guess it, uh, in modern healthcare, most of us really want to encourage feedback. It's the way we get yeah. better. It's the way that we learn. Um, I guess it can feel very difficult in the heat of the moment. Emotions can be very high. Um, it's okay to, you know, take a step back. There will always be routes to submit feedback if you don't feel confident enough or if you're feeling too angry or upset, in fact, to respond in the moment. Uh, you can ask to speak to the clinic manager or the clinic lead. Uh, you can ask to speak to, for instance, the hospital or mm -hmm. trusts, uh, PALS department, so patient advice and liaison service to submit some feedback. Um, you know, where positive, it, where possible, it's really good to offer positive suggestions about what could be done better. But by all means, do also say what emotional impact something has had on you, because that can make uh, things even stronger. Um, yeah, I think those are my main. Yeah, well, absolutely. And tips. I think often it's not in relation to HIV care, but it's when you know we're, we're seeing other healthcare professionals. I know for me, when I had cancer. Yeah, and I saw an oncologist and they were asking me things like how I got HIV yeah. and you know, what I was, you know, and then when I went for a blood test, they wrote like HIV positive <laughs> with a, a big circle around it. And I, you know, I, I was fortunate in that, you know, I felt sufficiently empowered to, you know, complain and, and change hospitals. But for many people, when we are feeling really vulnerable, it, as you say, it, it can be hard to speak up. And, and another issue that comes up a lot, you know, for, for those of us who are older, that, you know, when we have other healthcare um, concerns, that we're ping-ponged around. I was going to say, I mean, I think what we're trying to do very much uh, in my own service at the Royal Free, but I think increasingly other uh, clinical services are asking us more about this, is taking back some uh, aspect of care coordination. Mm. So I think for people where things are becoming very complex, since 2012, we had this horrible piece of legislation that meant our services were a bit split up. This mm. was the Health and Social Care Act, so we're not able to provide all aspects of your health care. And that led to some people, I think, being very much, that's HIV, this is your GP. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do now as specialists is say, I may not be able to provide all of your care, but if you, I'm the service that you're seeing that you trust the mm. most, 
can we help support you with some care coordination? And that might mean trying to ensure that you don't have doubled up blood appointments, that we share results, oh. trying to make sure you don't have an x-ray in one place and an x-ray in another place, trying to co-locate appointments. If things are becoming very difficult, or you feel you're not, you know, you feel you're having communication issues with another service. Do I have your permission to speak to that team and I'll explain what your HIV treatment does and how it works oh. and what the interactions might be and our pharmacist can help. So it's using the resources we've got, but to try and support people better so that they don't have that feeling that they're falling between the gaps and that services oh. are not communicating. And I think for a lot of people without HIV, the coordinator of their care historically has been their GP. Oh. But I think for a lot of people with HIV, they would say they would prefer that to be in their HIV centre. Oh. And we are taking quite a lot of that back to try and support people in that way. One of the things that does hinder and makes it so people are ping-ponged is because they don't tell their GPs that they are positive. So, yeah, having care in the clinic would be... Mm. Especially with comorbidities as well. Mm. Yeah. I had an experience where I was referred by my chubby doctor to an ear, nose and throat specialist because oh. I was getting some recurrent throat problems. And, but my doctor and me, well aware about kind of uh, uh, comorbidities, different kinds of cancer, all that. There was a reason for it. And I waited sort of eight months and actually it was the day came and I got to see the ENT specialist who literally looked at my throat for a millisecond and then it was over. I was like, this looks all right to me. So... I then went straight into um, patient self-advocate mode and just, well, the reason I was referred by my HIV doctor and whatever. And, and it, ENT specialist did that kind of, oh, we've got a right one here. Oh. You, could just, you could just tell. And, you, yeah. it's, you, and it was, um, and their response was kind of, they did a little bit of a normal life HIV, whatever, because they'd done 20 minutes of it at med school. Oh. And, and, and this was in a much lower prevalence yes. area, so it mm. poss quite possibly I was the first long-term diagnosed with HIV mm. person that this ENT specialist had ever seen. But, the, but a note f in the referral from my HIV specialist saying this is a cause for concern because yeah. would have conveyed that message. I wouldn't have had to do it to a doctor who clearly hadn't heard of expert patients or a yeah. partnership <laughs> approach. Um, and that became really challenging. And, and, and so especially as, as a male, because you know how poorly engaged we are with medical services, you think, well, I'm not going to mention this because I'll wait eight months mm. and I'll go and I'll just be whatever. So it was a, a, but the, the, the positives of this story, without going into too much detail, I was able to feed that back to my HIV clinician, who has now, they have now changed their practice of putting a note in yeah. to the specialist to explain why it's a cause com for concern other than it just being a middle-aged man, kind of. That, that yeah. was another layer to it. And I think that's right. That's oh. our best way of educating our colleagues, right? Because I, can't, I could spend all my time going around other departments, going to primary care, educating about the things that are associated with HIV at every age. But actually, I'm the specialist in the clinic who's starting to see perhaps more anal cancer in people as they age uh, that other specialists might not be aware of or might not see. And so therefore... In my referral letter, it needs to say this is the increased prevalence in this population if you're not aware and this is the reason for referral. Um, and I think I do think that sits with us. I've said I can't necessarily provide everyone's care. You might be better off seeing, well, you, you definitely would be better off seeing a diabetic specialist for your diabetic care or yeah. a cholesterol specialist if you've got very untreatable cholesterol. But for me to say what the increased risks are for someone with HIV and why it's important to treat, even though you might be outside of guidelines for someone who's not living with HIV, I, I think that sits with me to be abreast of that information and on top of it and make sure that I'm informing people as things evolve. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Angelina, what can we as patients do in relation to advocating for ourselves? Because I know sometimes you know, when we go into an appointment, we might have so much we want to say and then yeah. we just forget. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Firstly, we have a responsibility also to take a little bit of um, time in terms of how we look after our care. So I, I came up with a couple of mnemonics. <laughs> <that I'm laughs> one is for patients and it's called prepare. And one is for doctors and it's called listen. Okay, oh. so shall I go through it quickly? Two. So prepare for patients is about, P is about planning what you're, because you have... 10, 15 minute appointment, planning what you're going to say to your doctor, 
Um, the R is about doing a bit of research beforehand, and of course I'm talking about doing research on places like iBase and NAM, mm -hmm. of course. NAM, <laughs> plug, plug. great <laughs> website. If they're all plugging, check out AIDSMAP.com. <laughs> that one. Um, but also the E is around explaining. You know, when you get to the doctors and, and I'm going to see Tristan, I'm experiencing mm. headaches. Explain to Tristan how often do you experience, how, how, you know, how much they affect your quality of life. Mm. So really explaining, because in that way Tristan will be able to, you know, act on what I'm saying. And then the P is also around prioritizing. You know, we, nowadays we see our clinicians maybe six months, depending on who you are. So, and you have so many things in between visits, so prioritize what are the three top things I must make sure I talk to Tristan about before I leave the consultation. And then A is about asking questions. I mean, all the clinicians I've met over the years love questions, mm. you know. And, you know, the more you ask questions, and they'll be happy to answer them. And if they don't know, they'll find out, you know, what, what else, where they can give you the answer. And then the R is about returning if things don't work out. So I might go and do all these things, but it doesn't work out. Just go back or call, call the clinic, make another appointment. And then the last one is um, the E is about exploring other options. So if you go in and, and you're not able to do all those things, take this one along with you. You know, the power of peer support is incredible. Use it. So that's for us as patients. We need to do something about it. And for clinicians, the, mnemonic, the Monica developed listen is L is for listen really listening to the patient to hear. And then I is about insisting on a response. If I come in and see you and say, Angelina, how are you today? The, my instinct would be to say, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you ask me, are you really fine? Like this one I was saying, I'm gonna come up with lots of other things. And then S is about, you know, you know summarizing what you've said and smiling. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very quick example to that one. I, you know, I've got a um, very good, uh, Community. He's a community nurse. He told me one time a patient he was seeing in the hospital had been given a, diagnose, um, a diagnosis with the doctor and given the prognosis. And then when he asked the patient, what did the doctor say? What's your prognosis? The doctor, he said it was good. And he asked him, so what did you understand by good? So I think I have maybe 10 years to go. And then when he went and spoke to the clinician and said, what did you mean when you told patient A about their prognosis said, oh, I think he had about four or five years. So it's about summarizing and really being clear that we understand what you mean mm -hmm. to say to us. Mm -hmm. And then T is around trusting what patients say mm -hmm. and not being judgmental, just really believing. If I come to you and I say I'm experiencing, you know, whatever it is, I have a reason for saying it and really just believing me. And then T is a, trusting, yeah? And then E is again exploring other options about in terms of, you know, Encouraging me to go and access peer support because, as you're saying, you can't do everything, but you can be a co coordinate my care. As mm -hmm. I was saying, go and see Jack, go and see Michelle. And then, what's the last one? N is about exploring new technologies. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of, for example, you know, we know that there's a, a dearth of, you know, there's a huge gap in terms of, for example, involvement of women in clinical trials. Mm. If I rock up at the clinic, don't just think that Leswana has an 18-month-old baby. She might not be interested in joining a clinical trial. Ask Leswana mm -hmm. because there's a way she may be, even if you think she won't be able mm. to actually, she may be interested, just make it with her. Mm. I will That's say it. that the only reason I'm on the clinical <laughs> trial is so that my clinician would, would shop. I'd shut off and stop bothering them. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And, but yes, you're yeah. an injectable treatment. Yes. Um, so far, it's, I've only had my first injection and I love it. Um, no reactions. The bits that they told me about, yes. But Tristan's explained some more. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's injectable treatment available across the UK now? It is, it should be accessible across the UK. If you're not able to access it, your clinic, you should ask them uh, why. I was going to add one N, if I may, to oh, yes. Angelina's N to go back, which is that sometimes, it's not perfect, but also be aware that sometimes a new pair of eyes can be useful. Oh. And what I mean is we know that the feedback in HIV is always, I want to see the same person, I love seeing the oh. same person, it's really helpful. I agree that for a lot of your care it is, but if you have seen the same person for a long period of time, you may fall into a routine of communicating yeah. where both of you may make assumptions about the other person. Oh, I know that my doctor's really busy. I don't want to disturb them. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, they're probably really happy to... They may be busy, but they're there to hear your problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they may make assumptions about you, you know, oh, well, I won't ask them this because I know that this happened in their life before and blah. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually seeing someone fresh sometimes 
need not be scary. It may be an opportunity for you to say things you might be embarrassed to tell your regular clinician. If you've known someone for 10 or 20 years, you might not want them to look at your genital rash, you know. You might, whereas actually seeing someone new, you might think, oh, I don't care. I've never, <laughs> met, yeah, I've never met you before. You know, I don't care. So yeah. I think, you know, be aware when seeing someone regular is very yeah. helpful, but don't be shy every now and again of a fresh pair of eyes. Absolutely. And we've only got four more minutes and we've got some questions. Get a quick one. You need to explain what injectables are. Yes. And two... Um, Oh, lost it. Okay, Should quickly, really quickly, Quick. what are injectables? Injectable therapy for HIV is for some people. Uh, it's not going to be suitable for everyone. Uh, the injections are given once initially uh, at time zero, then at four weeks, uh, and then every eight weeks after that, two injections into your bottom. Discuss with your clinic or your clinician whether they're suitable for you, but bear in mind at the moment, uh, it does mean that you have to go into your clinic every eight weeks. Fantastic. Next question for you are COVID vaccines safe for people living with HIV? Yes, COVID vaccination is, of course, a choice. I think uh, we, a number of us have had quite a few COVID vaccinations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, many people were thinking, should I, do I need any more? What I would say is that COVID continues to evolve. At the moment, there are reported cases of another new variant. Um, so I think it may be the case that more vaccination is required, uh, but certainly people living with HIV, they're safe, they're effective, uh, and you will be eligible for COVID vaccination. Fantastic. Last quick question. What's the life expectancy for people living with <laughs> HIV? Um, people with <laughs> HIV who are diagnosed uh, fairly early into their infection, uh, go on to successful antiretroviral therapy, have a very normal life expectancy. They remain at increased risk of some conditions, uh, and so it's very important they stay engaged in care if possible, report symptoms early, uh, and get checked up. And I'm, I, you know, so we we do see changing science around things that people develop as they age. But overall, if you report symptoms early, you're managed well, you're able to take treatment, life expectancy is good and the future is bright. Yes, fantastic. And got a comment from Jo, Josh. Hi, Jo. Um, jo was saying that she went to Pride in Surrey wearing a U equals U t-shirt made by Angelina. Um, <laughs> and lots of people did not know really? what U equals U is. So wow. just highlighting the importance of explaining it effectively and we've only got two more minutes to go so going to go around and everyone which direction would I start with <laughs> start it's making it harder for you going last but yes right. <laughs> yeah one yeah. tip for someone living with HIV in terms of how they can get their best health oh find what gives you joy and exercise that Fantastic. And do it. Brilliant. Um, make time for self care, and that doesn't just look like putting a face mask on or like getting a bath bomb or something. It's very much about being in tune to what your needs are and finding ways to like um, fulfil yourself. Fantastic. Be selfish, <laughs> because we are caring for other people, caring, working, doing everything that everybody else gets to do but you need to be selfish for yourself. So taking that time out for self-care and enjoying some pleasures. <laughs> yeah, self-preservation comes first, definitely. Um, I think listen to your inner voice. If something's telling you something, uh, whether it's something you need to address yourself or whether it's something you need to talk to friends about or whether it's something you need to talk to, you about, uh, talk to your clinic or your doctor about, listen to that inner voice. Wonderful. Live your best life. Make no apologies to anybody. Now put your phone on silent. Your phone on silent. <laughs> when you're in a live broadcast. <laughs> Fantastic. And that seems to be the sound to say that time is up. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining me. Huge thanks to Disruptive Live for all of their technical wizardry and... Thank you all for joining us. And oh my goodness, it's gone off. Jeff, is it It's time for to go to work. Put your phone on silent. Thank you all so much. See you next month. Bye. Bye. Bye.